Hello everyone. Today we are going to go through normalizations. Let's dive into it. So what is normalization? From Wikipedia, normalization means adjusting values measured on different scales to a common scale. If you Google normalization, most likely you are going to see two common ways of doing normalization. The first one is called min-max normalization, and the denominator is x minus minimum of x. The denominator is maximum of x minus minimum of x. So in this way, we can do a rescale for the value x. The next one is called z-score normalization. This one is doing not only rescale but also recenter. With z-score normalization, it's gonna it's gonna normalize your distribution to standard distribution, and it's done by minusing the mean and then divide by the standard deviation. If you have statistic background in your university, most likely they have gone through a similar concept. If you forget about this, just Google it, and it should be relatively simple to pick up. So why normalization in deep learning? There are many benefits. It helps stabilize the training process by ensuring features are on a similar scale, preventing features with large values from dominating the learning process, which leads to faster convergence and improved model performance. So the first one is pretty obvious on faster convergence. By scaling features to a similar range, the gradient descent optimization algorithm can update weights more effectively, leading to a quicker training times. The second one is improved generalization. Normalization can help the model generalize better to unseen data by reducing the sensitivity to feature scales. The third one is stability in gradient calculations. So when features have vastly different scales, it can lead to very unstable gradients in backpropagation. Normalization can help mitigate this issue, whether it's vanishing or exploding, or exploding gradients. The fourth one is pretty important. It reduced the internal covariate shift. So this is especially true for batch normalization. Normalizing activations within each layer helps to maintain a stable distribution throughout the network. This is very crucial for our uh, deep architecture. I'm going to go through more details with example later. This is an example of how internal covariate shift can happen. Let's say your training data is training from actual cats and dogs, and obviously they follow some kind of distributions. And when you actually do testing, it turns out all the testing data is actually cartoons which is a little bit, the distribution is different from your training data. And if you don't do any normali batch normalization, it's very likely it won't perform well on testing data because of the internal covariate shift. So this can confuse the model a lot. I take this example from this website. Where to apply normalization in deep learning? Usually you can do, uh, you can normalize input data, for example, the data that you feed into neural network can be normalized before entering the network. This is basically pre-processing. The next place is activations. This is more relevant to our talk today. So we can also normalize the activations, which is outputs from the hidden layers neurons in the neural network. This is often done to stabilize and accelerate training, especially in deep networks. So first, let's go through batch normalization. For simplicity, I just pull out a layer with four neurons from a deep neural network. So it has four neurons representing four features, let's say x1, x2, x3, x4. And then this is a mini batch uh, with three samples. And the sample value is just random. I just come up with random numbers. Batch normalization means we're going to do normalization and we're going to do calculation of mean and standard deviation for each row, like for each feature. So for X1, the mean is 5.3, standard deviation is 4.9. Similarly, for X2, this row, we get mean and standard deviation. And then for X3, we do another calculation. For X4, we do another round of calculation. So normalization happens across mini batch. It's independent for each feature. After we get the standard deviation and mean, 
For all features, we apply the following two activations and get the normalized value. The normalized value equals to the Z score uh, normalization, which is the original value minus mean over standard deviation. After that, we apply a, a additional an additional scaling and shifting parameter. So each node or neuron have learning parameter gamma and beta to represent the scaling and shifting. So the scaling is obviously this gamma and this beta is shifting. So these two values are learnable. So why is batch normalization not used for transformer? So batch normalization have its own limitations. So in batch normalization, the mean and standard deviation are calculated within the current mini batch. However, when the batch size is small, the sample mean and sample standard deviation are not representative enough of the actual distribution. And for a sequential model, we see more small, smaller batch sizes because the sequence is very long. This usually happens to allow a model to update its parameter more frequently with smaller subsets of data. The transformer is very popular among the sequential model, right? So it usually have small batch sizes very often. So batch normalization doesn't work very well. And to be more specific, we usually do padding, which means adding zeros to make sure the data size is consistent to make the input size equal during self-attention, which is not part of the original data and can mislead the, the model a lot. So this is a example. Let's say we have two input. The first one is hello, uh, exclamation mark, and then my name is Martin. And in order for us to go through the self-attention matrix, because the dimension is fixed, we actually have to add two paddings for the first input. So padding will be all zeros. And, and when we do normalization using this, it's gonna confuse the model a lot because we have to include this unnecessarily zero values. So what's the solution then? The solution is to do layer normalization. So layer normalization is very popular in sequential data set. And again, I'm gonna use an example of one easy four neuron uh, input layer. And then again, it represents four features. And then the sample output within the mini batch is all random. This time when we do the mean and standard deviation calculation, it actually happens across features. It's independent of each sample. So we get the mean and standard deviation of all the features here, and then all the features on the second sample and all the features of the third sample. So in this way, we actually don't have to do padding at all. For all the features, we apply the following two activations and get a normalization value similar to batch, no batch normalization. And then uh, again, we apply the scaling and shifting similar with the batch normalization. So this is layer normalization. Next, I want to talk a little about the RNMS normalization, which is a relatively new normalization method, and it's catching up in popularity. So RMS norm normalizes the activations by dividing them by the root mean square of the activations for each layer. So unlike layer norm, RMS norm typically does not center the activations by subtracting the mean before normalization. It does include scaling by a learnable parameter, but there's usually no shifting parameter either. So the RMS is only doing rescaling. It's not doing any recentering at all. To compare with batch norm and layer norm, RMS norm's normalization process and is simple and without overhead of calculation, calculating mean and variance. Additionally, RMS norm claim that the scaling factor is more important for stabilizing the norm compared with the shifting factor. So that's why they are not doing any of the shifting recentering. So RMS is actually preferred in many scenarios where computation efficiency matter. You can see for a lot of recent models like the LAMA version of GPTs and then for DeepSeek, they're all using RMS norm. So it's definitely catching up. So this is the formula for RMS norm. You can see it's a lot more simpler. There's no additional steps, just one. AI is the activation for the I neuron. And you have to first calculate the RMS for A. It's basically adding up all the AI square 
and then divide it by n. n is the total number of features, which is the total number of neurons in the input vector of this specific layer. And then there's a scaling factor. This again uh, is the scaling factor that the parameter that I mentioned, it's learnable and it's applied right here. So this is RMS normalization. Already look a lot simpler than layer or batch normalization. All right, hope this helps. Thank you everyone. If you like my video, please subscribe, like, or comment.